What person in the world does not want to be loved? It's one of the great evils of this world that there are children who grow up never experiencing it, not knowing love from another human being. How can they love when they haven't seen it or received it? How can all people know true love? Even those, those who have never experienced it or seen it. Here's one proposed answer that I came across. It's advice from a psychologist to a young person who is struggling to give love to her partner. This is what the psychologist wrote. The only way you won't be trying to control getting others' love is when you learn to love yourself. To give yourself the attention, caring and respect you might be trying to get from others and to engage in the loving actions that support your highest good. Contrary to the idea that loving yourself is selfish, loving yourself is self-responsible. Loving yourself opens your heart to receive love, the kind of love that comes when you are connected with your own internal source of love, which then enables you to share love rather than always trying to get love. For this psychologist, love comes from within. To release the power of love to others, you have first to love yourself. Loving yourself opens your heart to receive love, which then enables you to share love. Now today we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about our love for each other in one passage, and we'll come back to that advice from the psychologist later. The passage I'm going to read is from uh, John's Gospel, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. I'll just find it here. Not sure what page it is. Is it up there? 958 in your Pew Bibles. Now, this is part of Jesus' farewell speech to his disciples. It's just before Judas, well, it's after Judas has left the room and it's before he's arrested, trialled and put to death. And it's roughly in the middle of a long conversation Jesus has with his disciples just before all that happens. So let's read. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather him up, throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I, not do, not, I do not call you servants anymore because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, 
but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. This is what I command, love one another. Let me pray. Lord in heaven, we are so blessed to have your word. And here in this passage, you tell us about your love and our response to that love. Father, we pray that as uh, we listen now, you would speak to us. And by the power of your word, you would change us, Father. Please help us to hear and to enact what you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So these are among the last words Jesus spoke to his disciples before his arrest, trial and death. So we need to listen carefully. When you know you're speaking your last words, you tend to say things are important. Jesus begins, I am the true vine. Now, there's a number of I am statements in John's Gospel. This is the last of them. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is commonly described as an unfruitful vine, a vine that doesn't produce fruit. By saying I am the true vine, Jesus is claiming that the fruitful vine is now here. He is saying that the true people of God are Jesus himself and those who are united to him. The one who brings forth good, lasting fruit is now here. Now the image of the vine which Ben brought us and which is familiar to many of us, the vine and the connected branches runs right through this passage. And the purpose of that image is to help us, and particularly his disciples, to understand some aspects of the relationship between Jesus, his Father in heaven, and his disciples. God the Father is the gardener. Right through the Old Testament, God has been at work pruning his people. Now as the gardener, God prunes the vine branches and the extent of the pruning is determined by the fruitfulness of the branches. If they are not fruitful, cut off, picked up thrown in the fire, burned. Now, Martin Dunlop pointed out to me the other night at Bible study that that's still the practice in modern grape orchards. The burning kills the diseases that the unfruitful branches might be carrying. Now, Jesus doesn't go and explain the metaphor in that way, but he may have had that in mind. The fruitful branches are also pruned, aren't they? Some translations substitute trimmed clean, where we read pruned. Now, this trimming does not lead to the branch being removed. Instead, it leads to the branch being even more fruitful. So the contrast Jesus is drawing is between cutting off leads to death and a trimming that leads to being clean and fruitful. In verse 3, those listening to Jesus, the disciples, are clearly identified as already clean branches. And the reason they're clean is because Jesus has spoken to them. He's spoken to them, it says, through his word. It probably means all of Jesus' ministry, what he teaches, what he is, what he does, and he goes on to die. And it's that word that makes the disciples clean. So Jesus, the true vine, he provides the life to the branches. Without being connected to him, the disciples will just be dead. The branch rocket head held up. God... The Father is the gardener who brings forth more and more fruitfulness from the living branches as he tends them with careful trimming. Now, apart from Jesus, 
the branches are lifeless and can do nothing. Over and over, Jesus insists that connection between the vine and the branches must remain. The disciples must remain in him. Without that connection, no life, no fruit. And it is the word, the living word, that makes the branches clean so that they're alive to bear fruit. And it's only after they've received this life-giving sap of the word that they are clean and that they may ask whatever they wish and it will be done for them. But then, of course, what they ask reflects their Lord. Their connection to Jesus shapes what they ask. Now, the image of the joined vine and branches gives us one side of what it means to be in Jesus. But it lacks something. And Jesus now turns to another way of describing that same connection. He moves now to relationship language, to the language of love. It's still the same connection, just being described using different language. Now, I don't know about you, but I find the opening statement in verse 9 magnificent. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now, I want you to think on that for a second. Jesus loves his followers just as God the Father has loved him. Now, the love of God the Father for God the Son is the love of the perfect for the perfect, the holy for the holy, the all-powerful for his only begotten Son. Jesus loves us with that same love. Bernard reminded us that love has a source, and the source is God himself, the Father. That mighty flowing river of love, he loves his only begotten Son, and his only Son loves him in return with all his heart, all his mind, all his body, all his soul. And Jesus loves us like that. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Bernard also reminded us of the great price Jesus paid to demonstrate that love. Verse 13 tells us there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for the loved, whether it be a friend, as it is here, or an enemy, as it is in Romans. And there's only one adequate comparison for the love Jesus has for his disciples, and that's the love of the Father for the Son. Now that's the love we're commanded to remain in. And then Jesus show, defines how we show that we are remaining in that love. We keep his commands. Put simply, we obey. Now Andrew brought out that link for us last week. We obey because we love our Lord. John tells us in his first letter, we love because he first loved us. Now, I don't know when you first appreciated Jesus' love for you, but when that awakens in you, there is a heartfelt response, is there not? There is a desire to obey. And as our understanding of the depth of Jesus' love grows, so does our love and our desire to obey. 
And that desire to obey is an always present desire in his disciples. Always present desire. And it's part of loving him. Just as Jesus responds to his father's love with obedience, we are to respond to Jesus' love with obedience. In verse 10, Jesus' complete obedience to the Father is the standard for our obedience to Jesus. In verse 12, Jesus' love for us is the standard for our love for each other. Let me read that again. Jesus' complete obedience to the Father is the standard for our obedience to Jesus. Complete obedience. Jesus' love for us is the standard for our love for each other. Now, Jesus' love for us, remember, is the same as God the Father's love for him. Back in chapter 13 of John, Jesus gave the disciples a new commandment. Love each other as I have loved you. He gives it twice more here in verses 12 and 17, paraphrased in 17. That should tell us how important this is for the people of God. This is a family characterised by love. The father loves his son Jesus loves the disciples. We are to love each other in the same way. We are to love each other with the greatest love. It is the love that is prepared to lay down one's life for the other, whether friend or enemy, whether adored or hated. It's an unbreakable chain. God the Father, God the Son, us, us to each other. More surely than night follows day, love for Jesus results in love for each other. Now, if we're honest, we know we won't reach that standard. That does not change the fact it is the standard. We cannot obey, well, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> we will not obey like Jesus and we will not love like Jesus. What are we to do? Humbly press on in dependent prayer. Our goal is to honour our Lord. Our goal is not the achievement of some false self-made up standard. It is God's glory, to show God's glory, to be his true disciples by bearing fruit, by being obedient, by loving each other. Let's now think back to the words of that psychologist. The only way you won't be trying to control getting others' love is when you learn to love yourself, to give yourself the attention, caring and respect you might be trying to get from others and to engage in the loving actions that support your highest good. Contrary to the idea that loving yourself is selfish, loving yourself is self-responsible. Loving yourself opens your heart to receive love the kind of love that comes when you're connected with your own internal source of love, which then enables you to share love rather than always trying to get love. I put it to you, that is how the world thinks. You have to love yourself before it is possible to give love to others. Compare that to Jesus. He loves you just as the Father loves him. Now love each other. They are very different sources of love. The advice from the psychologist seems to be that it's not possible to love others unless you first love yourself. 
Jesus tells us that he loves us. The Son of God loves you. He loves you so much he died for you. Now love others as I have loved you. Consider for yourself which is the firmer ground from which to give love. Which is the ground that powers love for those who do not necessarily love us? Is it possible to lay down your life for another if your first love is for yourself? If your first love is for yourself, how will you continue to love when the world hates you? As the Lamb of God, Jesus is supremely the one who gives his life for his friends. As his disciples, we are called to love with a love prepared to pay that same price. Now the Holy Spirit works in us to bring us to appreciate that love that comes from outside of us, that transforms us so that we desire to love and obey just as Jesus has. And it's the satisfaction of that desire that brings us joy. Jesus' joy came from loving and obeying his Father. As John writes his first we love because he first loved us. As John also says in that letter, if we don't love each other, we're not really his. As I've gone through this passage, there is a warning I must return to. There is a danger that Jesus warns us against over and over in this passage. It is a danger that kills love. At least it kills the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. Again and again, when Jesus is describing our connection in terms of the vine, he tells us, remain in him. And when he turns to using love language, he tells us to remain in his love. Many good things can draw us away from Jesus, even love. Many a follower has set out to live in love and has cared for others and done deeds of service to others, but then bit by bit, bit by little bit, the deeds of service themselves become the goal. Jesus slowly recedes in their thoughts. He begins to take second place. Bit by bit, the deeds and the good opinion of people around them, or maybe just doing the activity itself, comes between the person and Jesus. Now we are told, cut yourself off from the vine. God cuts you off, I'm sorry. But if you turn away from that connection, if you stop remaining in Jesus, that true love dies. We must remain connected to him for life and love and for true joy. The joy at obeying One time when the world was pressuring you not to obey. The joy at seeing the name of Christ honoured among those around us. The joy at seeing Christ's love displayed in our community. Joy at hearing of one soul, one soul who has turned to Christ. Joy at a life lived in faith and reliance on Christ alone. And even as his disciples, joy that we are counted worthy to suffer as our Lord himself suffered. 
joy that comes from God himself. Christ's joy was in obeying his Father. Our joy is complete when we obey. And we are commanded to love each other as Christ has loved us. Right through this passage, the emphasis is on remaining. Do not let anything, even some other good thing, weaken that connection to Jesus. Distract you from the source of life and love, that is Jesus and his love for us. Remain in the true vine. Remain in Christ. Remain in his love. That's how we are enabled to love each other. Without it, no fruitfulness. Now, a connection to Christ that is alive, like displaying love, will include prayer. If we do not remain in him, we cannot possibly bear any fruit that lasts. We will be cut off, thrown into the fire and burned. No true fruit. No true life. No true love. No friendship with God. No true joy. Only death and barrenness and joylessness. So, brothers and sisters, remain.